welcome. Add my welcome. And for those online as well, we'll just uh, have a quick prayer and then we're going to share from um, God's word in uh, looking at uh, Jesus speaking that I am the vine. Heavenly Father, give us a, a quietness of heart. Allow your spirit to move in this place, move within my life. Thank you, Father, for your word that speaks so powerfully about how you want us to live. And as we do live the way you call us to, as we fulfill those uh, directives from you, you bless us with beautiful promises. So I pray, Lord, that we'll be blessed today with beautiful promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the past two weeks, uh, Ross has uh, begun uh, and introduced this uh, series, Seriously, I Am. And uh, I think we need to understand the significance of each of these seven statements in the Gospel of John. And because not only is Jesus expressing who he is and what he can do for us, he's also expressing the truth that he and the Heavenly Father are one. And in uh, this, uh, these first uh, 15 chapters of the Gospel of John, we, we have seven I am's. Now, this is not the seventh, or this is the seventh one, but this is not the seventh in order, but just the way it's worked out for, for the series. But in John 6, we read of, I am the bread of life, a truth, a metaphor truth. And the promise is, whoever comes to me will never go hungry, whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Then there was John 8. I am the light of the world. And the promise, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 10. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. John 10, 11 and 14. I am the good shepherd that Ross preached about last week. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And Ross challenged us last week that uh, we all follow a shepherd. But have we chosen the good shepherd? John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die or they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then we get to this passage in John 15. I am the true vine. I am the vine. This is another truth with a promise. Jesus' I am statements have identified him with the I am, who I am, of Exodus chapter 3 that Ross talked about two weeks ago. And rather than go through that, I just encourage you, if you haven't watched that sermon or listened to that sermon, please do. And these, as I said, I am statements of Jesus demonstrates the absolute deity of Jesus Christ, that he and the Father are one. Jesus speaks with authority and truth, and when we uh, read through the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we come across these words right at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. What a slap in the face for the teachers of the law. And yet listening to Jesus preach and teach and share life, there was so much clarity for the crowd that they knew that he was somebody very special. Let's look at the scene. In John 13 and 14, Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room preparing for the feast of the Passover. He's teaching them. He's serving them. He's challenging them. He's encouraging them. And the last verse of John 14, before we move into John chapter 15, 
Jesus says this, I will do what the Father requires of me so the world will know that I love the Father. And then he said, come on, let us leave. Jesus then took his disciples and uh, moved from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives where they were to find lodgings and uh, they were in, finished up in the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas betrayed Jesus. So in this chapter, Jesus is giving some of his last teaching to his disciples before he's crucified. What should he leave with them? What might be appropriate? What could they hang on to as he departs this world that he could feed into their lives? For more than 45 years, I am that old, okay? I am that old. For more than 45 years, I've had the utter privilege of being in a role within a church somewhere, Australia and in America for a couple of years while I studied as well, in pastoral care. The opportunity, the privilege of walking through life with people is something that I take very seriously. And I do that at HR here. I do that at Hume Ridge. I don't see as many people as I'd like because for a lot of us in ministry here, we don't have enough hours in a day, not enough hours in a week. But I like to connect with people. I like to hear people's story. I like to encourage people that they might remain in Christ or get to know Christ. Many of us know Ross and Debbie Dodds. I think Deb might be here today, but I'm not sure. She is, she is good. I don't want to look at her. But I did talk to Ross and Deb during the week, and uh, Ross gave me permission to tell this little bit of a story. So hang in there with me. Ross is battling the horrible disease of cancer. And like many of you here and many online, you are battling with horrible diseases as well. Ross has given me permission, as I said. And two years ago, nearly to the day when I was talking to them this week, Ross was taken into ICU and he was uh, not expected to live. He called each of his three children um, to the ICU unit with their partners and they were to come to visit him and he individually spoke to them into their lives. He shared his love with them. He shared his appreciation for them. He shared their unique characteristics that made them who they were. I even think he gave them words of wisdom, but he'd probably be doing a thumbs down at this point in time. I think he was going to watch me. But what a beautiful opportunity Ross had then, and this is two years later and he's very sick again, of being able to have an intimate conversation with those he loved. This one-on-one -on -one time was so special for Ross. And I truly believe that it was an absolute blessing for each of his children and their partners. And back then, two years ago, God did a miracle that brought Ross out of ICU. We need to continue to pray for Ross and for Deb and for many others in the church that we know and people you know and you love who are struggling with terminal illnesses. It made me think, if I knew I was close to my death, what would I say to those that I love the most? What would I leave with them? What would I want them to know as words from myself to them, as an investment to them, as a legacy for them? What would I like to leave them? Jesus had this experience. And we're going to read it from, from John chapter 15. He was with those he loved. He knew he was leaving very soon and he had some words of encouragement and advice for them. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciple. And we're sorry, we keep on going, just on the bottom there. There's, that that this, this command, he finishes off in this section with, in verse 17, love each other. There seems to be so much of the remaining in Christ that we have to be challenged by is based on love because God is love. Why did Jesus speak of the vine? Jesus often spoke uh, where there was a visible image for him to use and to teach by. It might be that he passed some vineyards on the way from Jerusalem to um, the Mount of Olives. It might have been that uh, there was an awareness by the people. They might have passed, passed the, um, the temple um, in Jerusalem because of the, uh, the golden vine adorned the pillars there of the temple. It doesn't really matter. The fact is that it was the right message at the right time for the right people. A message that if we can totally appreciate its meaning in the context of where Jesus was at at the time and what he knew his disciples desperately needed to hear to sustain them in the hours, days, weeks and months that lie ahead. And I'd like to think this same message can sustain us today and into the future as well. There are many components to Jesus' teaching here. There's the vine, there's the gardener or the vine dresser, there's the branches, and there's the fruit. Firstly, the vine. I am the true vine. Now, it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, I am the vine. He said, I am the true vine. Then in verse 4, he says, I am the vine. It seems uh, that uh, the, the original vine, which was Israel, wasn't a very good, healthy vine. We read in Isaiah chapter 5 these words. I'll sing a ballad to the one I love, a love ballad about his vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard, a fine, well-placed vineyard. He hoed the soil and pulled the weeds and planted the very best vines. He built an outlook, built a wine press, a vineyard to be proud of. He looked for a vintage yield of grapes. But for all his plans, he got garbage grapes. Now listen to what I'm telling you. You who live in Jerusalem and Judea, what do you think is going on between me and my vineyard? Can you think of anything I could have done for my vineyard that I didn't do? When I expect good grapes, why did I get bitter grapes? Well, now, let me tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll tear down, I'll tear down its fence. I'll run it to ruin. I'll knock down the gate and let it be trampled. I'll turn it into a, a patch of weeds, untended, uncared for, thistles and thorns will take over. I'll give orders to the clouds not to rain on it. Wow. When God established Israel, he did everything he could for them to be productive and a worthy vessel to represent God. And we read in verse 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 4 there, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not already done? And what did they do? 
They made a right mess of it. That's what they did. Not, not just every now and then. It was continually. They seemed to be distracted by the world around them, competing, comparing, wanting something they had, and turned their back on God. And this resulted in fruit, not good fruit, but bad fruit. Verse 4b, when I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad grapes? And again in Jeremiah, we read, Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? You see the picture here very clearly that God wanted to bless Israel as the vine. And yet it just didn't work out because of their disobedience. And yet we can see from where we are, having the Old and New Testament together, that the plan and the, the process that the, what was in the Old Testament with the Israel and God's people has also been added to by us as the church. The fact is that uh, the truth of society today is thinking they can do good things to win God's approval. But as we know in John 01, but if we are in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus Christ, um, his son, cleanses us from all sins. The only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus It is not the connection of Israel or to Israel or even to the church or any other godly or religious group that allows us to, uh, to come into God's presence, to be part of this amazing vine. In verse 15, chapter 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing is nothing. It's not just something. Without, apart from Jesus, we can do oh, this or that. In God's sight, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That's why it's so important for us to remain or to abide. That word is used 10 times in these first 10 verses of, uh, of John 15. Stay connected to me, Jesus says. That is not religion. That is friendship, as we'll read a little bit later on in um, John 15. The vine is the source of life. All the nutrients, all the goodness to feed and produce good fruit comes from the vine. The vine gives us life. And I'll say this again probably a bit later, but I think it's so important for us as we, we just understand Scripture, especially this section of Scripture, is that all that God wants us to do is to remain in Christ. Hold on tight to him. Then there's the vine dresser. Verse, uh, second part of verse 1. My father is the vine dresser. The role of the vine dresser is to care for the vine so that it produces good fruit. In verse 2, we read, what the vine dresser does. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Now, I'm far from being a theologian, but I like to read knowledgeable people in Scripture, and uh, in reading this passage, there's a couple of points of view, or two points of view, um, and uh, I'm going to Try to share them without getting you uh, mixed up in your head like I was a bit when I was reading through this stuff. Anyway, the key, I think, to this part is every branch in me, in, in Jesus, everyone who knows and trusts Jesus as Lord. And then there's two sort of branches that, uh, that God, the vine dresser, deals with. Those that do not bear fruit, and Jesus says the vine dresser takes it away. I want to refer back to, I guess, what Ross said last week with the Good Shepherd in chapter, John chapter 10. My sheep listen to my voice 
and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And in Romans 8, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this word, takes away, is the Greek word ero, which is interpreted as lifted up. And that lifted up doesn't sort of fit with um, that every branch that does not bear fruit, uh, he takes away. But bear with me. We go past vineyards these days, and there's some on the way out to Dolby on the highway, and we see them around a lot more these days. And they're up on frames. They're up off the ground. But back in Jesus' time, the vines laid on the ground. They just ran wild on the ground. But in doing so, they often picked up bugs and diseases, or they, the, the, the ground was wet and it uh, affected the, um, the grapes in the vineyard, affected the, uh, the, the branches. So the gardener would lift up the vine and would put a rock under it or would put a bit of some twigs in the ground and lift them up so it, it, it got them off the ground. What I think is important is that God's not angry here and just slashing things around um, and wanting to hurt and destroy us, but he's wanting to, if we look at that word error again, that, that uh, Greek word, the lifting up. So there are... There are um, branches on the vine that are not producing fruit. So God, in a gentle, firm, clear way, lifts them up so they can, hopefully, bear fruit. Let me go on. The branches that do bear fruit, the vine dresser prunes. Now, that doesn't sound too good to me. I'm not the gardener in our family. Jenny's the gardener. And she learned from her mum was the most vicious pruner I've ever seen in my life. Um, I thought when she finished with pruning, whatever she was pruning, it was dead. Okay? But several months later, she was right. It, it grew and, and produced great flowers and fruit. Pruning is not a comfortable thing. It, it is the taking the shears, cutting things off, things that hinder and restrict the fruit from receiving its full nourishment from the vine. So the lifting up and the pruning can be seen as discipline to bring about the best in us. Hebrews chapter 12. This is a challenging bit of scripture, this one. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not take light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as, dis as, as, as discipline God is treating you as his children. For what children do not, are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. And then from verse 10b, God disciplines us for our good in order that we uh, may share in his holiness no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained in it. Let's be willing to accept the discipline that God works in our life as branches so that we might be healthy and that we might grow and that we might bear his fruit. It might not be discipline, it might be trials, tough times, and we all go through tough times. James says, consider it, my jo consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any, many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. This uh, pruning, this cutting off, is the, has to happen so that, so that the growth can come back, so that fruit can be produced. I guess it's worthwhile at times to consider, even ourselves, be reflective, to see what needs to be pruned. The selfishness that I struggle with needs to be cut off. The pride that I feel at times needs to be cut off. The insecurities that I might be struggling with need to be cut off. The anger that comes into my life some days needs to be cut off. God does it in a way for our good. He does it because he loves us. And the fruit. How does fruit happen? It happens when one is attached to a life-giving source. What is the most important aspect of your life right now? Is there anything more important really than your relationship with Jesus? And sometimes, I guess some days, we can be overpowered by the importance of not having enough money or relationship problems and issues or struggle with depression or a whole lot of things, finding a partner in life. All these things are things that probably weigh heavy on many of us at times. But what is the most important thing? What is, what is the key to our being and our key to living? Fruit, uh, fruit bearing is not the concern of the branch. If there are many times in my life that I believe it is. Fruit bearing is the responsibility of the vine dresser in connection with the vine. What is the fruit? I guess the first thing that comes to your mind is possibly what came to my mind, the fruit of the Spirit. If every day of my life I read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, my life would be continually transformed. That the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And then Paul says, against such things there is no law. There is no restriction. There is no limit. It's the other things we're living in our lives, in our lives. And the promise of the Holy Spirit in, uh, in John 14, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will um, ask the Father, and he will give you what, another advocate to help you and be with you forever as the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees nor knows him. I guess in so many ways that our, this passage is so much about relationship, isn't it? As we remain in the vine, relationship with Jesus, then the vine dresser cares for us, the Father, and then the fruit that we bear is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I just think when we look at this passage and we apply this principle, the promises that come that we can do relationship well. We are to remain in Christ. If we have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is so much hope and security in remaining in Christ, in the vine. And in, in John 15, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burn. This is a real clear warning. This is a different word than we use the word arrow in, in verse 2. This word uh, thrown away is uh, ekbolo. And it basically means to expel, to cast out, to get rid of. But this, in this verse it says, anyone who does not abide in me. The difference from verse 2 to, to verse 6 is abiding non-abiding. And I guess the truth is there are many who choose not to abide. And because they will be cast out and expelled and got rid of, they will not see heaven. How do I know I'm abiding in Christ? Let me finish with this. 
I think there are a couple of obvious ones here in the latter part of, of John 15. Firstly, bearing much fruit for God's glory. Secondly, that in bearing fruit, I'm keeping his commands, a life of obedient servanthood. Thirdly, that we would experience joy. Um, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy might be complete joy. And fourthly, to love each other as Jesus has loved us. This love is the essence of who God is and is a direct command. So I guess what I want to say is I, I want to finish and I'm going to pray that as we remain in Christ, as we stay connected to the vine, then we don't need to worry about the fruit that we bear because God will care for us so that the, the sap and the energy and the food to produce all those beautiful qualities of, of Christ-likeness and godliness in our lives will occur. I think we get so caught up in looking at what the, or trying to pursue this and to produce this that we can easily let go of the vine. Let's stay, remind, let's stay remained in the vine. Let's abide in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are a good and gracious God. You're a God who cares for us more than we could ever imagine. You love us beyond our capacity to understand. And you desire us to be hungry for Jesus. That we won't be tempted by Satan and the things of this world to be distracted to follow some other shepherd. That we'd want to follow the good shepherd. In our remaining in Christ, I pray that we will embrace your lifting up and your pruning so that you will, your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven and in and through our lives. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for who you are. We pray this now in the name of Jesus.